Lynn, I, we, this is perhaps the best uh, collection of lawyers I've ever seen. We have yet another lawyer for you. Uh, Tammy Belinsky, who is a Virginian, who is an environmental defense attorney with Wild Law and vice chair of Virginia Forest Watch. Tammy Belinsky. is based in communities who come together when their natural resources are threatened by corporate power. And the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund uh, started out representing communities in the traditional uh, path of trying to help them prevent uh, a, a corporate factory farm, or a uh, power plant, or a cement plant, or something like that in their community. And it was uh, many defeats down the road that the founder realized that they were like gerbils in a wheel, in the regulatory system, spinning around, never getting to a destination. And so, they came up with a different model. They did a lot of work, a lot of studying. And the model is one of education of communities. When they face one of these challenges, they quickly learn that they have no political power, that the corporations have all the power in, in the political influence, the local, right down to the local government. Virginia here, it's particularly difficult being a deliberate state. And then they get in the regulatory wheel, around the regulatory wheel and never get what they want. If they decide to challenge the action judicially, they find out that the corporations have all the rights. They have the due process rights and they have the equal protection rights. So the founders of Cell Death decided to set about to find, figure out how that happened. How did we get to where we are today where the corporations have all our rights? And so they established a a uh, school system uh, uh, occurs usually over a weekend time span where the participants are educated in the long history based in the Constitution of the corporate power that we know, all of us know well today. It's been talked about over and over again here today. And the system, the, 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 the Constitution is really a blueprint for corporate governance. It was the first corporate, the first, the first governance doctrines that came over here from, from England were corporate charters. William Penn later became the governor of Pennsylvania, was given a charter to come and plunder resources to make the, the king rich back in, back in England. So the democracy school is based on the really the populist movement of communities organizing, educating themselves on the, how our Constitution is funnel, fundamentally flawed, was later uh, interpreted to give the corporations the rights under the 13th and 14th Amendment, uh, due process and equal protection, and that they assert those against us every day. There was an economic forum here this morning and someone insisted that we didn't need to change the Constitution. But the, the, the reality is, is that all the power lies in the Supreme Court and that even if you tried to change the economic model, the corporations would be working themselves up through 
our legal system to the Supreme Court, who are the ultimate decider. It's another lie George Bush is told. It's the Supreme Court who decides in this country. And they would use that system then to defeat any attempt to change the economic system without first changing the Constitution, stripping the corporations of their rights. So the, uh, the, the, what the work that the Community and Environmental Legal Defense Fund does is, is assisting communities understanding how we got to where we are today and then using that information to change the power structure, one local government at a time, by adopting local government ordinances that ban the behavior, the corporate behavior, that uh, ordinarily the communities are trying to prevent, the, the plunder of their natural resources. So they help communities pass ordinances to ban, for example, I'm very interested in doing this locally, to ban corporate mining of water. And in addition, that's just one example, we've had, we've attempted in Virginia to adopt an ordinance in the community that was trying to prevent land application of municipal sewage sludge, well, so they call it land application, but it's really disposal of pollution. That, that attempt failed, the local government wasn't uh, um, strong enough to step out of the box and adopt that ordinance. A year, about a year later, the organization was successful in getting a community here in Virginia to pass an ordinance banning chemical trespass in order to fight the impending um, um, plunder of uranium from a 50,000 acre piece of land east of here uh, for uranium mining. So the town nearby adopted an ordinance making it criminal to have chemicals trespass from that activity into their town limits. So I can't wait uh, for, I actually hope it never happens. I uh, hope, hope, hope it's never needed. Um, and uh, in addition to banning that corporate activity, the other thing that Tom Lindsay advocates for is for incorporating the rights of the natural world into those ordinances, because the natural world has no rights under our Constitution. We have this, you know, the system of our Constitution is founded on property law. Property law, personal property rights are the keystone. Um, the Constitution being a corporate charter uh, upholds that keystone. The Bill of Rights came later, and then after that, they've all been usurped from us by the corporations. And we have a legislative system, and we know how that goes. And uh, the regulatory system came later, really, to keep us in our place. Once you get on that wheel, you can't get out, you can't get off, and you can't get what you want. So the ideal of the work of the democracy school is to establish community self-determination. What does the community want to be? What does it want to look like? And let it decide. Who decides? That's what the work is about. We don't know. We, we're losing sight of our legal system, the construction of it, what works, how it works, how it's being. It's very, you know, it's been, it's been at work for a long time changing this counter-revolution, as one of the panelists said, uh, it's time to take back our communities. So I have some pamphlets about the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund bringing the democracy school to your community. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. And we have one more panelist, Keith McHenry who is the co-founder of a wonderful organization, a global movement, Food Not Bombs, and is a coordinator of national food relief efforts for survivors of Hurricane Katrina. Keith McHenry. Thanks a lot. Um, part of my message, Food Not Bombs, not only besides uh, serving free food to the hungry and so on, but working for social change, has also become a target uh, 
uh, probably from the very beginning, um, in 1980 when we started, by uh, the law enforcement community and the FBI, CIA, and other agencies. And that was relatively benign, although we were aware of it through the uh, early 80s, until 1988, when uh, on August 15th of 88, um, nine of us were arrested for serving free food um, with, uh, in Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. And um, that you know, seemed relatively simple enough uh, at the time, getting arrested, it seemed like city police, riot police arresting us and so on. But as things evolved, we uh, ended up learning uh, about two years later after uh, over 200 arrests, that, for instance, on September 27th of 1988, the San Francisco police wiretapped my home phone without a warrant and had produced a memo claiming that I was organizing 3,000 people to take over an army base and that I was working in alliance with a number of other organizations, which turned out to just be peace activists, uh, organizations, collectives. And that was uh, my first introduction to uh, um, being wiretapped without a warrant. And uh, around that same period of time, we were wearing the Funat Bombs badge, and we started finding out uh, from uh, military personnel, particularly at airports, but also in other venues, that the uh, uh, Pentagon had a special training courses on domestic terrorism, and that the case study was the organization Food Not Bombs. And they would explain to us that the, we were the most hardcore terrorist group in the United States. This is before terrorism is fashionable. Um, so we were uh, kind of going through, going, going through that problem. And then by 19, 1994, I ended up being framed on the uh, California Three Strikes Law, and I faced 25 years to life in prison. And spent, uh, during the course of this uh, uh, arrest in San Francisco, the district attorney claimed I did over 200, um, 500 days in jail. So. Um, so this, uh, we, as things evolved, um, we just approached the uh, Clinton Justice Department and tried to get, uh, Howard Zinn had suggested we talk to the Clinton's uh, Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Justice Department to see if they would send out um, federal marshals to protect us. And what, besides being, uh, we had made a video called Food Not Bombs Greatest Hits, um, which we have out uh, for sale. And it was, we were be, basically beaten most days for serving free food by the San Francisco police. And I was beaten 13 times. I had to have two surgeries to um, retake, repair injuries from some of the beatings. And also, um, I, amongst the so-called police brutality that was happening, there was, a, on three occasions, I was picked up off the streets, taken to the police intelligence office, had my clothes stripped off of me, and then I was lifted repeatedly by my arms and legs until my limb ligaments and tendons ripped, and which you could hear. And then I was placed in a small box, about a um, little less than four feet by four feet by four feet foot square, cubed, the chain link box that hung from the ceiling of a uh, uh, police uh, um, special operations office and held there for four days. Um, it was freezing cold. Um, I was also on other arrest, held in solitary confinement naked. Um, I was held in, in huge, huge rooms by myself, uh, um, naked and freezing. I was also placed in, in uh, solitary confinement with the heat turned up extremely. I was forced to stand. And this kind of stuff happened. Uh, other members of Food Not Bombs had similar treatment. And some of the uh, Food Not Bombs activists were taken to the uh, uh, to mental hospitals and four-point restraints and injected with uh, uh, psychological drugs and so on. This kind of all went through like the 90s under the Clinton administration, and the Clinton administration supported this. And one of the main supporters of this campaign of terror against food not bombs was uh, uh, Congresswoman Nancy Pelosi. So it's not, not any surprise that she's uh, uh, not doing anything currently. Now, uh, um, also during this time, fortunately, Amnesty International declared us prisoners of conscience due to a letter writing campaign and to an investigation they did finding that the U.S. government uh, was not defending our rights. We lost in federal court all the way to Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal. Um, we lost in state courts. And, uh, and it was clear that there was a, a campaign of violence against us. Now, the reason the police gave for doing this 
was that we were making a political statement and that was not allowed. And they made this public comment a number of times to the media on TV. Um, then, uh, after, after going, eventually going through that, I eventually, after, uh, I had to go to trial at, uh, quite a number of times. And uh, for, for the three strikes trial, I was charged with assault battery, strong on robbery, assault with a deadly weapon, and possession of stolen property. The stolen property being Berkeley Farms milk crates. And um, eventually, because of political pressure and huge numbers of people coming to my court appearances and letters from hundreds of people and uh, uh, Amnesty International denouncing the U.S., um, the United Nations Human Rights Commission denouncing the U.S., I was finally um, able to plead no contest to uh, disrupting the police commission meeting and getting a year probation. So that was that kind of like Clinton era uh, repression, you know, that was kind of some of the things. One other thing happened is my home phone became a pay phone and I couldn't get the phone company to fix it. They kept claiming that the phone I had for 10 years was a pay phone. They kept, every time I pick it up and dial, I'd say, please deposit uh, 35 cents. I called the chief of police and I admitted, I said, oh, I know you don't uh, wiretap phones here in the United States or anything like that, but I'm really, you know, it'd be great if my phone could be fixed. And they sent a guy in a van over with a, a, with a ladder on, his, uh, on the van. They put the ladder up on the telephone pole outside my house and across the street the garage door came up on the house. And on the inside that garage were two men with laptops and folding tables with headphones. And they made some signals to the dude on the, on the uh, ladder and eventually uh, after about 30 minutes he got down, put the ladder away, drove away. The garage door came down with the two guys behind it and my phone was uh, no longer a pay phone. So these are some of the things. Then. Um, uh, with Oklahoma bombing, food not bomb tactics got arrested around the United States and questioned for that. And had someone like one uh, guy got his band equipment taken in Dallas, Texas. And then we had 9-11. Um, and then since 9-11, um, quite a number of unusual things have happened. And uh, the Green Scare is one of them. The Green Scare has, been, uh, has picked up a lot of food not bomb activists who have been accused of terrorism. We found in... Uh, uh, at a, the uh, University of Texas Austin Law School at a constitutional law course. One of our volunteers, Elizabeth Wagner, was taking the class and they had a guest lecturer from the FBI. And the guest lecturer um, did a PowerPoint presentation and he listed the 10 groups that were on the FBI terrorist watch list that they had to infiltrate. And uh, one of those groups was Food Not Bombs. Another group was Indie Media, which was, I was also involved in from the start. And um, they started arresting people like for eco-terrorism type things. One man was arrested in uh, San Diego, accused of burning some SUVs and so on. The, uh, the um, evidence was he lived at the Food Not Bombs house. He was a, a vegetarian, these kinds of problems like that. And eventually another person uh, called the LA Times and said that they spray painted the SUVs and burned them and they, they let him out. But this is kind of a, lot, a wave of things. There's like a number of Fudan Bombs activists currently uh, in jail now. There's a, uh, McDavid is a, uh, had volunteer with Fudan Bombs. You might have seen recently in Elle magazine a blog story about uh, a woman, Anna, infiltrating Fudan Bombs and, um, um, and, and attending our events and so on and trying to seduce people to get involved in violent acts. Um, which she and herself ends up doing, but our volunteers get accused of and, and arrested. And then um, I discovered that I was on one of the 100 most dangerous Americans in the New York Times, uh, reported, had a list of, of State Department uh, people that are, are domestic terrorists, and my name was on that. And then on a recent flight, or a flight about two years ago, back from Turkey, visiting Funat Bombs there, I get to Chicago O'Hare, and um, I had problems like getting my ticket at the other, getting my, uh, my baggage checked and everything in Istanbul. But I go to Heathrow, no problem, Heathrow to Chicago. The Homeland Security uh, meets me at the uh, door of the plane. They tell us, make an announcement, we have to show our passport when we get to the exit of the plane. I get to the exit of the plane, they don't even look at my passport, take me and my coworker, another volunteer from that bonds, to a back room. We have to get our luggage, go to a back room. 
They searched through all our belongings to take everything out of my wallet. They found the ACLU card uh, for the director of the Arizona ACLU's business card in there. Oh, what's that about? They asked me, um, <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, what's my role in the violent group Food Not Bombs? What do I know about the violent food group Food Not Bombs? They asked me uh, how I made a living, what the name of my company was. And then they proceeded to take everything in my wallet, put it on a, a big table, and input it into a computer while another guy talked to me about forest fires in Arizona. So um, this kind of, this, uh, um, in my, in my efforts to deal with that situation, I found out that I was on a number of terrorist watch lists, that the Pentagon had listed many of my activities on the talent list as, as, as uh, um, serious ongoing threats and so on. So just for being a nonviolent activist here in the United States, you can end up in quite a bit of trouble. And, uh, and it also precedes the 9-11 event. And, and uh, when being tortured, the most common thing, people say, oh, what questions did they ask you? What questions were, were they asking you when they were torturing you? They don't actually ask you questions when they torture you. The purpose of that is to, is to send you back to the community, to terrorize the community, and to stop resisting the policies of the U.S. government. And so, I, you know, I, um, and then just in final closing, when I went to get help for having been tortured um, by the U.S. government, I went to the Hopi Foundation after Abu Ghraib, and uh, the Hopi Foundation helps victims of torture from Guatemala, El Salvador, and Bosnia. And they, when they found out I had been tortured in San Francisco by uh, uh, Tom Drar, CIA, and San Francisco Police Intelligence uh, um, Organization, they said, oh, our funding um, specifically states we cannot treat people with post-traumatic stress disorder or any other issues who are tortured in the United States by the United States. So that uh, um, indicates that they know that they are torturing American political activists. Thank you. What incredible stories from this panel. Uh, anybody have any questions? Uh, my question is for Kevin. Um, you talk about uh, basically the political problems. Uh, Give me a favor and stand up. Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Talk about the political problems of uh, the infringement on the Constitution and the political solutions. But uh, I find there are lots of social problems, first of which being uh, almost a culture of paranoia and that we're okay with video cameras as long as they catch the terrorists. And secondly, uh, chronic apathy in that we don't care if people are being tortured or uh, you know, under surveillance. So how do you address the social underlying problems as well as the political solutions? Those are constant problems we all face in, in, in trying to make positive change. Is uh, the feeling of hopelessness and apathy and and, and kind of a, as I, mean, I don't know if you heard the last panel, I talked about kind of self-denial, denying these things even exist, uh, that these even problems. And uh, in, in my city of Baltimore, uh, we live with uh, video cameras all over the place. And uh, it's really interesting. This is kind of a big blue light in the sky at night and uh, on one side it says, believe, that was the mayor's slogan, believe. On the other side, 24 hour video surveillance, Baltimore police, it's a, it's a strange world. Uh, and as you drive through these neighborhoods that have these signs you see in the windows, you see, you, you, you see, you see these signs that uh, say, I believe we've been deceived. So people, people are getting it, uh, but it, it is a hard struggle, and it's, but it's always a hard struggle, I think we have to, Recognize it's never a majority that creates change. It's really not. It's a minority. And so don't worry so much about those who are apathetic and, and, and don't care. Uh, find those that do because they're out there. And so, uh, you know, one thing, it, it, which is true and kind of, it's almost like we're in a sales job. When you're in a sales job, you get told no more than you get told yes. And so focus on the yeses and build from there. And what you end up trying to do in the organizing, which is what works for me, is you, you, you start with a, a core group, a small group of people who agree with you and who want to work through these kind of changes, and you try to build concentric circles out of that. And so you get gradually build people who are more involved, in various degrees of involvement, until you get the outer rim. And don't focus on those who are too busy or don't care. That's, they can do that. But they'll come along in the end, and uh, it's the people get this education at their own speed. And sometimes it takes people having experience. You know, Cindy Sheehan, before she was Cindy Sheehan, 
um, uh, was an apolitical person. You know, she didn't really focus on this stuff. And uh, now she's, she has gone through an amazing education, not just through her own son's you know, horrible uh, murder, uh, but um, through her own political experience in the United States and seeing what the reality is of our political system. So people learn at their own speed and uh, you know, take those who are with you and go from there. I'd also like to say that it's nice to see someone under 30 asking us a question. And, and you know, we have always felt that it's the youth that have the, the, the gumption to, to stand up and fight back. So you talk to your fellow young folks. Uh, you talk their language. We don't talk their language anymore. And I think you'll get some good gut response. I think that, that people are feeling the pinch, and certainly, you can open any conversation by saying, how do you like those gas prices? Did the government want to do something about that? You get the right answer. Thank you. I wasn't going to say anything, but well, I was 70 yesterday, but I think I've got 10 years. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, two situations in Florida. One was eminent domain. They tried to knock down a bunch of the, uh, the fate was bringing a swimming pool to Hollywood, Florida from Fort Lauderdale. We've done that greatly. We kept it there. But to subsidize that, this developer named Schwerdlaw, I call him Shrewdlaw, he wanted to, to knock down some places, you know, build on super high rise. So any comments on eminent domain. But another one, more important, is the, uh, and I don't know too much about it, although I've sat in the trial about three, four times. The Liberty Six uh, in, in Miami. Apparently, it's a case of a trapman, and these uh, inner city fellows were baited uh, the way it appears, at any rate, uh, by FBI type, you know, undercover and so on and so forth. And they wanted to make a, you know, the debate was money, and then the talk was all the blow up Sears Towers, and, and now. Question to the attorneys, I'm a high school history teacher, but double jeopardy. They tried these guys twice. Both times it was a what do you call hung jury, I guess. And they're gonna they're talking about doing it a third time. And the money, I, you know, I go in the courtroom, other than maybe somebody's mother who was too afraid to talk to me, I'm there, there's six guys, you can hardly see the light irons. they got little wires, they don't use light irons anymore. And they're, you know, they're they each have an attorney, they each have a federal marshal, where you can see the pistol in the back of their jackets when they sit down in front of you. And then they've got any number on the prosecutor. I mean, the money that's going into that, millions of dollars, and they just want to nail these guys, and they're going to keep at it. So they, I want to say something about that, but any attorneys want to give some? I, I will weigh in on that because it was a case when I first read the headlines, I said, Ralph, if we were still in business, I'd be sending you to Miami tomorrow to tell these folks you got a lawyer. Uh, it really is what it's a preemptive strike, and it, we our criminal law is supposed to punish crimes, not look at them and say, well, maybe a crime could have occurred here. And it really is based, as you said, on a completely on an informant. These fellows are from, ironically, Liberty City, uh, and um, some African American, some Haitian American. And I think all they ever got out of it was there was some small amount of cash and a pair of boots. Right. Uh, isn't that right? Nice, yeah. The boots. And, uh, but as far as double jeopardy is concerned, you only can, double jeopardy applies when you're either convicted or acquitted. It doesn't apply when there's no decision. And uh, basically the case law says the government can get three times to convict you. You would think they would be so embarrassed by this case, which is a legacy of the great, uh, Gonzales, uh, Attorney General, that is, uh, that uh, they would say, let's go home and forget about it. You forget about it, we'll forget about it. But they don't say that. They, they mm. keep at it because it's a power play. It's a thing to say, we can tie you up. We can ruin your life. Get used to it. Plus, well, it was a high-profile case. And a, a, a letting them go free would not be what they want to see. So and if, as far as double jeopardy goes, there's no conviction, no, no finding of not guilty. They're not, they can be tried again in the state court. But even if they're found not guilty in one court, they can be charged also in the federal court. 
Well, this is federal. Or, or, or vice versa. Or vice versa. I mean, the, 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 the state and federal courts are separate tracks, and so double jeopardy doesn't really mean all it says. As far as the eminent domain thing goes, that's somewhere I think the government has really, the Supreme Court recently, about a year ago, I guess it was, maybe a year and a half, overreached, overexpanded that power of eminent domain to really allow uh, government to seize property much easier and for broader reasons. Um, it'll be interesting to see, though, down the road, who knows if we ever do get to the revolutionary phase we want to get to as far as a more progressive society. We may see that eminent domain being used against electric companies and oil companies and seizing them and nationalizing them. I mean, I know in, in Maryland, in Baltimore, we've had uh, BG&E's, our electric company, and there's been talk of them in the domain, actually, uh, because we've had a 72% rate hike in a year. Uh, and so there's, the people are pretty pissed off, and so there's some talk about, uh, you know, there are actually people rallying around the idea of seizing the electric company and making it a public utility. So, just one point on that quick, uh, very quickly, the, the video is so lousy, you can hardly see them, and the audio, you can hardly hear it. I mean, and that's intentional. I used to do, there was a lot of work in drug de, drug defense, and that's intentional. I do it that way because they could do a nice, crisp, clear picture. Uh, but you know, that underground, seamy look is you know, that's much more enticing. And the case reminds me of the DeLorean case. I don't know if you remember John DeLorean getting busted in a cocaine deal. He just he didn't bring the money. He didn't bring the drugs. He just showed up, and it was like all agents with money and drugs, and he was kind of just there. It's the same kind of this. The, the, the whole deal is done by the, the by the government, and they have these lackeys there to you know take the blame and, and get the headline. And, and there's a pattern to this kind of case. The fact that it was high profile was the whole point. I mean, this is a propaganda stunt. And the the past two State of the Union addresses, the president has claimed various successes in defeating acts of terrorism that were being planned and about to maybe occur. And he hasn't ever used this one, but he's used the 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 alleged plot to blow up the tallest building on the West Coast the, in Los Angeles a couple of times. He, he used about five cases uh, in the State of the Union a year and a half ago. And you looked at all five, and there was absolutely nothing there. And you looked at the ones this year, and there was absolutely nothing there. The, the closest thing to an act of terrorism was a few guys talking to each other about maybe we could consider doing something like this. Right? And, and this includes the, you know, the people responsible for us not being able to bring toothpaste on airplanes anymore, and they take this horribly dangerous toothpaste and toss it in the can in a crowd of people. <laughs> but, but, the, but the point is missed if you don't look at the chronology of it. Right? And Keith Olbermann did a great show where he pulled out the timing of every time there was a major scandal in the Bush administration, Within two days, there was one of these bogus claims of success in defeating terrorism, right? Consistently. You mean not every not every time there's a Bush scandal do you get one of these, but every time you get one of these, there was a Bush scandal happening within two days before it. it, it the timing is, is incredible if you lay them all out. This is the whole point. It's propaganda, and it's bad propaganda if, if the case falls apart. Well, that's some of them already have. Yeah, one, of, one, of the, one of the jokes that was made this week, and I don't know who made it on which panel or what, but they said, Bush always claims, you know, six years we've been free of terrorist attack. Of course, we were free of terrorist attack for six years before that, and for six years before that, and for six years, but anyway. Any other yeah. questions in the room? Yeah, and I, and I, I also, in the Food Not Bombs world, we've had for years now situations where the people that do the crime uh, we have like a, I have a friend Karen Pickett. She um, she ended up doing two years, and Mark Davis did eight years. And the people, uh, this is for being environmental activists, and they argued against taking down, unbolting a high tension wire in the uh, Arizona desert. And the three guys that actually unbolted the, the wire were one was FBI, one was state police intelligence, and one was an informant that, um, that uh, started an affair with, with Karen, and he taped them on, making love under their bed, and they played the tapes in open court, and he would try to have these eco-terrorist fantasies that she would like, like, you know, talk against, and yet they used that evidence to convict her. And this is, like with Aunt Anna, the woman that we've been dealing with recently, she's probably one of many people in our, in our movement who, uh, she actually got the blasting cap, went to the FBI headquarters in, San, in, in Sacramento to get the, the uh, you know, stuff to make the bombs. You got the bomb 
you know, recipe from them. She's the one that insisted that they try to make a bomb. And the whole time, the other people are arguing against it, saying, this is stupid, what's this got to do with like the environment, with organizing? And uh, so often we find this kind of situation where an a actual crimes that are happening are actually being done by law enforcement. And uh, in, in one of the wiretap memo case of mine, there was a guy that wore the same clothes as me and looked very similar to me, lifted a police barricade up and threw it out of line of riot police, and then I ended up getting arrested for it. And my lawyers pointed out that there was these doubles, that I had like three shifts of doubles, and they would go around and do crime, they would call up, find out what I'm wearing that day, had my wardrobe in their locker, put down the clothes of my day, then do a crime near me, and then I'd get arrested for it. And I kept wondering, what's going on with this? And then when you got to court, the, there would be like half undercover cops testifying, oh yeah, McHenry did this and that. And then there'd be innocent citizens saying, yeah, a guy in a black t-shirt and, and, and tennis shoes did this or that, because of course somebody did that. They were like a cop dressed like me. So this kind of dirty trick says happens like on all levels, all the way from local police to, um, to federal. It's, it's not new. I want to address the eminent domain question, I mean the eminent domain issue. Okay. Uh, there's, a, there's an attempt right now to get a local government ordinance passed right now in Montgomery County, Virginia, right, right here, <laughs> to uh, prohibit eminent domain based on uh, the Virginia Constitution. So you might want to contact Tom Lindsay, community environment legal husband. That's helpful. Yes? Uh, this is a direct response to the question in particular. I was just wondering who could answer if this slide or this war against civil liberties is orchestrated by Olin Scape and the various foundations. What's the role of these foundations and the Federalist Society? Are they the driving force behind this, or is this kind of spontaneous from the chain push administration? I think we all agree it's pre chain yeah, it's way before chain I mean, they certainly, whether or not they were waiting for something like 911 to happen or they orchestrated 911 is open to conjecture. Can you trace back to certain foundations? Well, I, I'm having a hard time finding that. I don't know, but I know that everything that went in the Patriot Act had been on their wish list for a long, long time. They have been great. You know, if you check back, I think in congressional history, you, I mean, you could find these bills being introduced by some of these folks way in advance, but they never would get through because they were just too outrageous. But it certainly was a law enforcement wish list. Uh, I'm not, I have my own experience with the Freedom Foundation, uh, but, uh, you know, who are very well organized, but I don't know that they could be ascribed to be the authors of this. This is a little bit more than they have to I wouldn't want to defend any of those foundations or any previous administration, but there was a huge step forward in removing our rights and in seizing imperial power when this administration came in. And it has all been pushed and controlled and managed by a guy named Dick Cheney and by a lawyer named David Addington. And, you know, well, there's a dozen of them you can't forget, and they should all be in chains. But but it, it comes out of the mind of Dick Cheney. Um, do you think Cheney is comfortable passing that on to Barack Obama or whoever? Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, are people worried about that? I would assume it would happen. I mean, it was happening through Paul Clinton. I mean, the stuff that was happening, he, he did like some of the most outrageous laws of American history. Uh, as far as minimum, minimum sentencing guidelines that like we have now, is, he's got a huge host of, of uh, responsibility in his administration for why we have the most prisoners in the world history. So, um, you know, it's like, uh, and they, I mean, they were torturing us. I mean, the Clinton administration knew that we were being tortured in San Francisco and gave us a nice little letter saying that was fine. I don't think that Cheney is well aware that Barack Obama is not the blaming progressive that some people imagine him to be. But uh, no, I don't think he wants Barack Obama to be the next president. And I think there will be a major effort to steal the election on the part of John McCain. Which does not mean that Barack Obama is an angel. It just means that there will be a major effort to steal the election on the, on the part of John McCain. Yeah. 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 Ye
John McCain. No doubt, no doubt the Democrats will also do their job in trying to steal the election, too. And that's one of the problems why they don't, they, you don't see these things get challenged, because both parties do it. You know, uh, they, both, they both do corrupt things in elections. And we just don't, don't just think that the Republicans are stealing, because it's, it's a two, both hands are. And this, this, this kind of stuff we're describing goes back for decades. I mean, I'm sure you could tell Black Panther stories of assassinations of Black Panther members and infiltration. I, I know, you know, when uh, Nader's uh, vice president last time, Peter Cameo, ran for president in the 70s, and they had some break-ins of their office. They got, them, got the FBI in the court, and in court, the judge asked the FBI agent in charge, how many infiltrators do you have in the Cameo presidential campaign? 72 was the answer, including the campaign co-chair. Uh, and then you, and you have the whole, uh, you know, like when the war in El Salvador, we had break-ins yeah, at exactly. Cambridge Baptist Church repeatedly. We had infl uh, uh, the Boston Lions against registration in the draft. I was the last non-law enforcement agent in that organization. Every single person in it was law enforcement. So, I mean, that's like, that's typical. So that was back in the, you know, in the 70s, mobilization for survival. There was like, I'm not sure, I, I might have been the last non-law enforcement agent in that. It was incredible, it was, it's, so it never, when we, we always like, we're joking, oh, COINTELPRO was over and all that from the 60s. It didn't slow down one bit, it just kept going right to, to the day. Now they have more money now, and they have more power now, the Constitution has eroded us, so they can do more now, and 9-11 provides excuses, and the terrorism, and the orange alerts, and all that nonsense. So no question, the judges, the courts have been, you know, infiltrated with more corporate and executive power supremacy folks. And so, you know, things are worse, but this is a long-term thing that's been going on for decades. Was there a question in the middle? No, I was going to ask Actually, it's several rows in front of you, and then we'll get oh, to you. I'm sorry, back there with somebody? Couldn't or? actually see. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I think. Uh, there's a woman four rows in front of you that I was trying to indicate. Oh, I'm sorry. And then I'll, I'll get you next. Right after. Right after. Right. Stand up, please.
evil component, my instincts are telling me this has to be a spiritual movement. And we need the, quote, moral majority. We need the religious right. We need to wake them up because they have been used as puppets. My instincts are telling me that's a clue, a key to this. Um, and I'm just throwing out some of my thoughts. I'm feeling real bad right now, guys. Well, I, I myself would li um, like to see, one of th from my perspective, you know, like some people go, well, why are you like so cheerful when you get tortured and stuff like that, right? <laughs> but, the re but the reality is that, that I'm actually like, you know, the, what happens every day for me is like, you know, a couple of days ago I got an e email from Ayers Rock from uh, uh, Alice Springs that Aboriginal kids are organizing and serving free food there and feeding people. Also, like in the United States, there's like hundreds of Food Not Bombs chapters. Today's the uh, uh, 28th anniversary of Food Not Bombs. And so, and people all across the country that are refusing, like we have like a whole, like workshops on surveillance and about you know, people like Anna infiltrating our organization at our national gathering. And people like are, are learning, yeah, you don't like buy into that. Uh, idea of some like you know hot girls trying to get you to bomb a bridge you know that it's stupid and so a lot of people are starting to get this idea that that um, that the not nonviolent direct action and staying solid with our principles is what's happening so I find that a lot of older Americans and older activists are feeling like well there's not anything happening on campus nowadays there's not something happening every campus in America has the most sophisticated huge political radical movement on it in this country. It is huge. It's bigger than the 60s. I was an activist in the 60s. I obviously speak on campuses all over America today. It is much more intense today. People that are, there's more activists on campus now than there was in the, in the 60s, and those activists are more solid and sophisticated. They have a much broader, more complex idea of what is going on, and the other thing about these activists is they're not going to stop. There isn't going to be a Vietnam War that ends and then they go off and become mainstream Americans or some kind of thing. These people are going to do this the rest of their days. We have Food Not Bombs volunteers that have done it every single day now for 20 years, for 15 years. There are people now that became college professor Food Not Bombers now, you know, work at Brooklyn College and things. So the reality is that there's, there's this huge mass movement in the United States the big difference is that in the 60s it was on TV, the mainstream media covered it, you had some idea what was happening. Today, it seems like there's nobody doing anything, when in reality, there are thousands, right on this campus alone, there's hundreds of students that that's all they do is radical left organizing when they wake up and when they go to bed. And that's what they're studying in college and that's what they're doing. Even in the, you know, in the most remote, um, supposedly rural, backwoods, colleges in this country, there is a huge activist, like SDS is huge, Students Against the Sweatshops, um, the Campus Anti-War Network, change, all of it. Yeah, <clears throat> it's so many things happening, it's such a huge movement. And the, the biggest thing for us, and then we have like indie media, we have Bikes Not Bombs, Food Not Bonds, we have all these uh, critical mass happening all over the place, really free markets, all these, there's so many things going on and it's really solid and really huge. And, the, and, the, and if you went and looked up indie media, just uh, you check out what groups are doing in, in those cities or any of it, it's just remarkable. And so we get this impression that this huge revolution is not actually happening when in reality it is. And, uh, and so it's actually really hopeful. And people's understanding of police surveillance and three strike stuff and, uh, and what's going on, people know. You just don't, do, you, you're always being watched, you're always being listened to, you don't have any rights, we all understand that. You just get like change society, and so that is the reality. All these kids are up. I mean, we all know Anna now. You know, we're all like freaking out. Oh my God, I had those twelve conversations with her. She, you know, disrupted what I was doing at the Republican National Convention. She did this, she did that, and you know, we see that. But the reality is, we just don't. While we're having that happen, we're just like saying, well, you've got to be nonviolent. You have to do direct action. You have to live by your principles. You have to realize that this is the most evil thing and that you have to dedicate your life to changing it. And there are tens of thousands, if not millions, of Americans that just do that full time in this country, but they're invisible because they would never, you know, you've never heard of Food Not Bombs. We've never been on national media uh, ever, right? Yet, where there's like, we are the ones that fed Katrina. We're the people. Why weren't we? We were the only people that down there feeding people, so why weren't we in the news? Or we fed the Orange Revolution in Kiev. Why weren't we on the news? 
Um, I mean, that might be the one thing, if I can step out there from there, that might be the one thing that all, every panelist here can agree on, is that the media is broken. And that if we could take back the media, if every organization that is represented in this conference today pooled their annual resources, how much resources have we taken, we bought a media conglomerate, that would change, that would change things. So, in fact, American liberals are the one species on the planet that don't understand the importance of having media. And every election cycle, we dump enough money into campaigns, into ads, on corporate media outlets that screw us all year long, that we could have created a brand new television network that actually, you know, gave us news. And, and we don't ever learn that, and we've been trying, so we, we're making little steps in, in the internet, in progressive radio, in trying to build TV stations on the internet and then move them to satellite and so forth, but, but yeah, that's huge. But I think I mean, part of the answer, I think, is what Kate said, that there are huge successes that are under the radar. There are huge successes in, in cooperative businesses, in green movements that are completely under the radar, but are, are real successes. But I, I think we need success, you know, where it's prominent, and, and, we, and, and not just for PR reasons. We need to take back our federal government in Washington, D.C. And the beautiful thing about the least popular sons of bitches that have ever held those seats of president and vice president, is that there's a crime for everybody, right? Impeachment, indictment, you pick your favorite crime. You don't have to agree with me that the worst thing is Blackwater, or the worst thing is the spine, or the worst thing is Katrina, or the worst thing is the stolen elections. Pick your, pick your favorite flavor. But if we impeach, or indict, and imprison, or both, Bush and Cheney, Yes, 99% of our work is still in front of us. Yes, there's still the media, industrial, military, corporate complex. But the next people who sit in those chairs have to be afraid of us instead of us continuing to be afraid of them. We start to take back our power. And so, and I, you know, I'm not going to, it has nothing to do with pretending that it's just murderous son of a bitch who's married to Hillary Clinton was a great president. It has nothing to do with pretending that there's not a corporate power structure behind the White House. It has to do with <coughs> taking back our democracy, saying we created an executive who was supposed to be accountable to the people. If we don't hold him accountable, all is lost. Because we still have 99% of our work ahead of us. Mm -hmm. We have to impeach and indict these people, and we don't have to even agree on why. There's, there's a reason for every single and even if we don't do that, even if he doesn't get impeached, we're still making tremendous progress. We, we're in the midst of a, a change that we can even, so we're so involved in you can't even see it happening. But there is a lot going on, there's a whole new economy developing that uh, is, is, is taking shape, a, a green sustainable economy is taking shape, and sometimes when you're in the midst of something you can't see it, and it's, you have to step back and look like, for, take for example, the gay rights movement. 1970s, early 70s. You could not even buy an advertisement for a gay rights um, uh, a meeting in the Village Voice in New York. They rejected advertisements in the Village Voice from the gay rights group in the early 70s. Now we're talking about gay marriage. I mean, you know, things change. And uh, you can pick up almost every issue like that, and you can see that kind of thing happening. Now, there, no, not, I could criticize progressive movements easily. There's lots of faults, lots of problems. But I also don't want to leave go feeling any hopeless. I mean, I think we are we are actually better off than we realize. We're also in the media front. We're taking back the media to the internet and the web. The traditional media is losing power. Newspapers are you know their their peak out their peak of reading was uh, in 1984 was 65 million. It's now down to 42 million readers a day, losing two percent a year. Cable news, network news dropping in their viewership, where's it all going to the web, which, we, which is not as controlled yet. And so we, we, we even, even on the media side, we're, we're, we're making some progress. So don't lose hope at all. I mean, there's a lot of work to be done, but it's being done. And I'm going to weigh in at the end as the amateur psychologist. <laughs> Get together with other people. Yeah. That's what this conference, to some degree, is about. That when you find people that, that understand what you understand, and are working, even if it's incremental, even if it's making one phone call a week to say to someone, would you come out to the peace vigil next Sunday? Uh, 
it's being with people that's what makes us able to function. I know for myself, people say, how do you keep on going? How do you, you're facing 30 months in jail. How can you just get out there? I'd be hiding under my bed. It's because I meet with people and people give me the, the power to keep on going. And uh, I also have to say to you, don't count on the ABA. <laughs> I don't think the ABA is. Uh, <laughs> they're not. They're not people. They're. 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 They're the enemy that we are fighting. You know, they are the corporate guys. And, right. Uh, guild. Join the lawyers guild. I mean, it's a wonderful organization. Fought the fought the Red Scare for people, not for corporations. I mean, uh, and a modest uh, joining for you. For what it's worth, by then we get to the gentleman in the back of the room. But the, the ABA did set up a task force that looked at signing statements and said that this is absolutely unconstitutional, outrageous. Went and testified to that it, it, back in January of '07. It was the first hearing that Conyers did laid out the most quintessentially impeachable offense, assault on the Constitution imaginable. And they were there testifying, and then they closed the air and go have lunch and move on. And, and, and so <laughs> nothing happens. And, and so everybody gets frustrated. But that's, it's, I mean, I, I don't know anything about the ABA, but that wasn't their fault. In this case, that was the fault of the American public for not saying, well, God damn it, how do we know this? Let's chase them out of town. So let's go back.